have your Bibles, turn to the book of Matthew. I uh, have preached this message, but not this message. I preached a couple thoughts about this one time before. Matthew chapter 9. One time I remember preaching through this text, and call it, it was one of those days where you think all these things happen in a day. You think you had a bad day till you see some of the things that Jesus encountered. And you say, I need the Spirit of God to help me because I don't know what a day is going to bring forth. But I know he'll help me and he'll strengthen me. So we're going to read Matthew chapter 9. I'm going to just read the first part of it and then we'll sort of allude to other things as we go. And Jesus entered into a ship and passed over and came into his own city. Behold, they brought to him a man sick of palsy, lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, and said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. And behold, certain of the scribes said within them, This man blasphemeth. You know, you can't, sometimes you can do the right thing and you just get in trouble anyway. I mean, write that down. I mean, Jesus did the right thing with the, and, and of course, and you know he had to be the right motive, but there was always someone who didn't like what happened. And he said, said this man blasphemes. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, <laughs> see, that's the, that's the part we don't have. <laughs> Jesus, knowing their thoughts, I love this. Uh, Wherefore, think ye evil in your hearts. Imagine getting that zinger, if you're the ones who said it. For whether, whether it's easier to say, thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, arise and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. Now, he didn't say heal sick bodies, but he could have said that too. And then he said to the sick of the palsy, Arise, take up your bed, and go into thine house. So this was an alert for the people who didn't believe that Jesus was Messiah. He said, Here, watch this. They can't say they didn't know. They just could say they didn't like and, and so, and the man rose up and departed to his own house. And when the multitude saw, they marveled and glorified God, which had given such power unto men. I'm going to read the next one, too. And Jesus passed forth from thence. He saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom. And he said unto him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. And that, that is the fascinating part to me. Two words. And the man left. Now, was it an irresistible calling? No. I think in Matthew's heart, he had wanted to serve God. Maybe he just never got the chance. Maybe nobody had had, a, a, had any faith in him. He had been passed by. And so now he had become this, quote, wicked tax collector. I, I've had, I've known some people who work for the IRS, and they said, please don't tell them where I work. Because they will hate my guts. I said, oh, that's all right. You know, uh, there's plenty of hate to go around. But, you know, interesting, you know, sometimes we get identified with what we do. So uh, Jesus says, follow me. The man rose. And it came to pass, as Jesus said, meet in the house. Behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to the disciples, why you just, you're a master with publicans and sinners. And when Jesus heard that, he said to them, they that have, they that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. But go ye and learn what this meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So in two instances, these Pharisees were not pleased with Jesus, nor what he did, and all he did was the right thing. You get in the drift that sometimes you and I might get in trouble for doing the right thing by being kind or being gentle or, or, or caring. And it cost them something. I mean, uh, these other people always had to criticize. There are some people that have that gift. You know, they wanted to be a spiritual gift. They were not uplifting at all. And the next story, it, then the disciples of John, and they're about fasting. And uh, Jesus talked about wine skins and putting new wine and new skins, not new wine and old skins, meaning that we have to be pliable and usable because God wants to pour his spirit into us, and, and, but we have to be prepared. We have to be ready. We have to be, be willing. As he was doing that, then there came a certain ruler. You get in the drift, this was going to be a long day. 
And, and, and this guy worsened. He said, my daughter's dead. And he has to have faith. And uh, then there's a lady, the woman, uh, who has the issue of blood. And she goes, if I can just get in to, to touch his garment, I'll be made whole. She doesn't even want to talk to him. She just wants to get close to him. And, uh, and she's healed. And people got upset. He said, give me a place. You know, the maid is not. And, and, and he, he, all kind of things are going on here. And uh, verse 30, I love this. And their eyes were open, and Jesus straightly charged them, saying, see that no man know it. <laughs> How are you going to keep this a secret? You know, because here's the blind men who were healed. You're able to do it, Lord. And, and, and then they departed abroad. His fame spread abroad in all the country. No kidding. And they went out. Then there's a, as they're leaving, just when you think everything is over, it's one of those endings. Here comes a guy that's possessed of the devil. And, and uh, they had, it was just, the Pharisees said he cast out devils through the prince of power, you know, the prince of the devils. And Jesus went about their synagogues and he preached the gospel of the kingdom. I'm in verse 35. Healing every sickness and every disease among the people. And at the same time, verse 36, he was moved with compassion. He saw the people. And he talked about laborers and a whitened harvest field. It's a full chapter. A one day in the life of Jesus. I think it would have been hard just to, to go through all the ups and downs of emotional. People are being healed. People are criticizing. God is delivering. People are angry. And, you know, women, are, you know, are, the, the lady is raised and dead. The blind guys see. And you're, and imagine Matthew, who is this tax collector who writes this down later. So you wouldn't have believed this day. You ever wonder what it's like in heaven when we all pray at the same time? And around the world, it's not that God is not paying attention, but he ministers to great need. We're going to look at some broad pictures about this chapter. And I'm asking the Lord to, you know, sometimes it's good to, to focus on the, on the little parts. And then you have to sort of step back and see the big picture. Because sometimes, you know, you read a parable and it's not intended to tell you step by step how to do something as much as to tell you one simple truth. And so we're going to look at this chapter in the big picture and try to pick out some pieces of the puzzle and say, Lord, how does that apply to me? Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word that records for us what you're able to do, what you did do. It tells us what people were thinking and their reactions to the power and the grace of God. Lord God, there have been times when we sort of have not always responded the right way either. And so I ask that you'd help us as we look in your word and, and give us just a clear understanding and a meaning of what you're trying to tell us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, when we look at the word of God, it's written so that we'll believe. These things were written so we would believe. And I want to say that so the Holy Spirit can energize and help us to understand that God is concerned about the needs of people. If there's one takeaway we can know is that Jesus cares for us. While we're yet sinners, he dies for us. He came to seek and save that which was lost. We know that. But here he puts into practice and he, re he reaches down and he touches people and he heals them and he, he makes them whole in situations that were beyond help humanly. I'm often surprised, you know, uh, we get sometimes some really wild, funky prayer requests. I, I, I'm never amazed that God answers them, but I, I'm just, it, it's amazing the things that happen in this day and age. Before, it would have been, life was much more simple. Now, we, we don't just get a disease, we get a real complex one. And our God is able to heal the complex as well as the simple, isn't he? He's not limited. He didn't have to do an MRI to figure out what was going on. And so in this single day, we see Jesus moving along and he's responding to what was going on around him in the power and the presence of Almighty God. 
Because when John baptizes him and the spirit comes down in, in the form of a dove, it, it really symbolized the presence and, and the power of God that's available to you and I as we walk and move and live in the spirit. He does all these things and he says, greater things will you do. Well, I tell you what, I've not healed anybody that I know of. I prayed for a lot of people and some were healed. I have had more occasions because I've been in ministry longer than Jesus was. He had like three years. I've had a few more than that. But you know what? The other thing is I want the, I want the power of God to be just as effective when any one of us prays. Matthew records these things. And I want you to know that sometimes there were people who disagreed with Jesus' ministry. There was controversy. The Pharisees, you know, uh, they represent the religious establishment. <laughs> I remember reading this book by one of our Assembly God evangelists, Christopher Allen. And the name of the book is called All Things Are Possible. And he was dry riding in a train car he had been asked to go someplace to speak, and it was with a bunch of Lutherans. Now, it's not a slam to Lutherans. But <laughs> some lady was ill, and he just felt prompted to pray over her that God would heal her. And God healed her and miraculously delivered her. And he says, this was not in the Lutheran theology at the moment. They had a hard time with it. He said, but I really don't care if they had a hard time with it. My God was there, and God did it. I didn't do it. I just was a prayer. And God reached down from heaven, and he says, and some of them said, well, this can't be. And he goes, well, the lady's healed. So, you know, you got, I think the vernacular would say, put that in your pipe and smoke it. You know what I mean? It's, it's a reality. <laughs> For those who are watching on video, <laughs> sorry about that. But, you know, there are some things that we can't explain but we know that God is in it. And we have sometimes compartmentalized him into, yes, he can do this, but he can't do that. And the longer, you know, we sort of get cynical, just being honest. And this whole chapter just from here to there, and you, it, you don't see him saying, okay, I'm tired, let me sit down. He is taken on the religious establishment. He's healing bodies. And he doesn't seem to be bothered by the kind of thing or if it's a demonic thing or it's blindness or issue of blood or even someone who is dead and he is just doing all these things. So the first thing I want to talk about is the Lordship of Christ. We sang that song, He is Lord. And Matthew has some uh, just snapshots. If you just look at our little snapshots, he was the Lord over disease in chapter 9 at the very beginning, when this man had palsy. He was a lord over disease. You know, can God heal, heal your disease? He can heal mine. He was the lord. He, he resurrected some lady from the life. They said she's dead. And uh, he does that. Uh, you know, he called this guy who really was spiritually dead, this Matthew guy who had given up on God. And he says, follow me. And the man followed him. We sometimes think it's just physical things, but here's a spiritual awakening in Matthew that says, I think God could use me. And sometimes God has to fan to flame some hopes that have died. And he does that with Matthew. And so we see that, in fact, Matthew, we're, right, we're reading the book that Matthew you know, scribed under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He was a lord over death when the lady, this uh, rich man's, daughter, this ruler's daughter was brought to life. He was the Lord over blindness when the two blind men were made whole. you believe I can do it? According to your faith, be it so unto you, he says to them. We see he was Lord over even the demonic forces when this demonic man in verse 32, they went and brought this man who was possessed with the devil and he cast him out. I think it was interesting in verse 33 it says it was never so seen in Israel. It was a first time event. Whew. 
I don't know about you, but there are some ways that, that would be sort of cool if there were some first-time events today where they hadn't seen for a long time the power of God, and he was shown through us. See, all these things, Jesus had victory. He set people free from things that kept them from where they needed to be, whether it was blindness, sickness, death, uh, whether it was demonic things. He was Lord. He was in charge. He was over whatever it was that bound them or that kept them or their infirmity or however you want to say it. When you talk to some people, they're defined by all the things they can't do. But Jesus seems to take off that barrier and he says, here's what I can do if you'll trust me. And on many of those occasions in his lordship, they had to trust him or they had to call on him or they had to, you know, do you believe I can do this? Yes, I can believe you can do it. To the father, yes, and he healed the daughter. But you know, the interesting thing, sometimes we don't allow him to be Lord in our society. We've taken him from that exalted place and we said, well, you can work at certain times whenever I think it's appropriate. Isn't that just a little bit uppity? That we would limit God from being Lord? He, none of these other things, the only thing that I know that limits God from working is unbelief. Where people don't call on the name of the Lord, then they can't be saved where we don't pray for the sick and they, then they can't recover if we don't pray. The only thing that I know that limits his lordship is our unbelief. Now, I'm not talk, talking about you, but people's unbelief. I don't want to do anything to limit him. How about you? We sang that he is Lord, he is risen from the dead. Well, you know, but he is my Lord too, isn't he? I want him to take that unbelief away because he is Lord over all these things and then some. And you don't, we don't find him getting tired at the end of the day. It's just he went through this in a day. Another thing about Matthew chapter 9 talks about faith. Much is said about faith. Faith is just a, root, a human response to what God is doing. Did you hear that? Faith is a human response to what God is doing. God initiates faith doesn't he? He gives us faith. But the problem is, we think that God has to respond to our faith. Wait a minute. He does, but it's our response to what he is doing. It's a little bit different. See, the emphasis is on God and not me. That's the difference what I'm trying to make. When God is in it, I'm all for it. And you are too. When I'm in it, we're all going like, nah, I don't know. Might happen, might not. You know what? If God purposed to do something, will it come to pass? Yes. God can do all things. I, I believe that. Can Jeff do all things? No. Can you do all things? No. But I can do things if he is involved. Yes. But I want you to look at some of these things. It talks us about the the importance of faith. The people who brought this paralytic man in, in chapter 9, verses 1 through 7, they had to have faith to bring the guy. And Jesus says it like this to them. He, he says that, uh, oh, he's, verse 6, it's easier to say thy sins be forgiven thee, but really what he says in, in so many words, son be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee, in verse 2, but it was the faith of other people that brought these men, this man to be healed. Because he couldn't get there without them. That's where we come in. Our faith is getting people to the place where Jesus could do something. Our faith doesn't make anybody healed. Our faith in the Lord. And I, I say, I'm making this mistake. You're going like, hmm. to hear the whole thought takes a little bit of faith on my part because I trust him. It may be all the faith you can muster to just pray the prayer. Is God honored when we take someone before him and say, Lord, I'm trusting you in this situation? Yes. Lord, I'm trusting you for wisdom. I'm trusting you for strength. I'm asking you for healing. Yes. Does, just because I ask, does it have to happen? You know, I have to also submit to the, the will of God. Because God has all things orchestrated 
for him to get the glory. That's the difference. Someone not too long ago says, why am I not healed? Then there was a loaded question. I don't know. I could give you 10,000 reasons why people aren't healed. They didn't they ask a miss to this and that. Why is this the hand of God move? I just know he does. And I don't want to be remiss on my part in asking and having faith and trust in him. So these people come and bring this paralytic man. Was this, was this a paralytic man that the, the people took the tile out and Matthew just sort of skims over it and just they let them down and then he says according to your faith be it unto you and the faith of the friends and the faith of that man and God brought him healing. I, it could be the same instance. The other the next one was the faith of this man who in verse 18 talked about his daughter and my daughter is dead so come and lay your hand upon her and Jesus rode and followed him and so did his disciples and the inference here is the daughter was healed. The faith in the dad caused him to seek out Jesus. Faith prompts us to the right place, doesn't it? It gets us to where we need to be where we trust him no matter what. I mean, what do you have to lose when someone's dead? That God would do the work we sometimes, I mean, I, I, I know one lady who just felt sure that some other lady was going to be healed from the dead, and, and it really, it, it really uh, took the stuffing out of her when God didn't heal, raise the other lady up from the dead. At the same time, I have heard on, on, in certain places where God has raised the dead. Off the hook kind of stuff. Why? So he'd be glorified? I, I, I don't understand why God chooses one over the other because I know he's no respecter of persons. And some people would say, well, it's because you didn't have enough faith. And they, they, if I didn't have faith, I wouldn't be praying. Does that still fine with you? There are some things that I'm leaving in the hands of the Lord, although I wish that in my own timing it would like to go another way. In this case, this ruler made possible by just coming to the Lord. You know, that's my part and your part. If there's a part that we can play, is we're making it possible for God to do the miraculous. We don't make God do the miraculous. The other one is this woman who had this hemorrhage. It's right after verse 20. For, uh, in verse 20, she had the hemorrhage of blood for 12 years. And she didn't even need to talk to him. She just wanted to touch his garment, the fringe of the hem of his garment, so to speak. And she had other... I think it was John who wrote you know, how she had invested all this money and lost it and she believed whatever the quote the doctors were saying. But she just had to get to Jesus. That's another thing we need to know. We just have to get to Jesus. Because he does have the words of life. I have to be reminded of that. I live in a world that's dying. I have to get to Jesus too. How about you? I need him to help me. I've lost loved ones and so have you. How do we handle that? I was talking to a lady the other day whose husband passed away. And I said, you know, it was a tough uh, season for you. She said, yeah. I said, God has been faithful. She said, yes, he has. That was her testimony in the grief. God has been faithful. To faith of the two blind men, verse 27. Hey, uh, son of David, have mercy on us. And when he was come into the house, the blind man came to him and, and said, and Jesus asked him, do you believe I am able to do this? And they said, oh, yes, we do believe it. And their eyes were opened. And this is one of the people that Jesus said, don't tell anybody. I find that fascinating. Someday I'll preach on that. Because he didn't want to just be known for his miraculous, but that was a part of who he was. The miracles of Jesus are one of the calling cards that the Messiah had come. But like the people who wanted to make him king, you know, the processional and on Palm Sunday, it would have been the wrong place at the wrong time because the Father was going to exalt him. The Father was going to see that his name was glorified. The Father, if he did his part, if he was a servant, if he, he did what God had required of him, then in due time his name would be exalted 
And you know what? Sometimes people in this life, go, what I call, go down in a flame of glory. They go down in faith, believing that the power of God is going to raise them up. And he will, and he does. We just forget that this life is not all there is to it. Sometimes a refusal to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ puts a limit on his power. One day he comes into the city and he says he could do no miracles in Nazareth because they didn't believe. So my takeaway from that part is, you know, the importance of faith. I've got to express some faith. I've got to trust him at his word. I have to say, Lord, I know. I, Lord, help my unbelief. I don't always know how it's going to go. The third takeaway from this passage is the power of prayer. As I alluded to it a little bit this morning where Jesus was going away to get away uh, from uh, the disciples and away from all the rigors of life to be with his father. But... The power of prayer is a communication and may I add a dialogue between you and I who are needy and, and an all-sufficient God. It's a God who calls upon the Lord, uh, you should say, we call upon the Lord to restore our health. We call on the Lord to give us wisdom. We call on the Lord to help us in our time of need. And we have testimonies of that tonight where God helped us, where God, when I say the word healed the truck, was that the way you'd say it? <laughs> Fall down a truck or whatever. And uh, can I just say it like this? Do you think it was a prayer when Jesus came to the tax collector and said, follow me? It was a heavenly dialogue. Sometimes the prayer comes from heaven to us. Will you obey me? And Matthew, in response to the offering or the prayer of Jesus, says, I'll follow you. We've often thought of us praying and asking the Lord for stuff, but in that prayer time, in the two words, follow me, Jesus was inviting Matthew to trust him. He invites us to trust him. The ruler came, and he petitioned the Lord, on behalf of his daughter, and he was interceding for someone else. Is that a component of prayer, intercession? Uh, asking God to work on the behalf of someone else, and the answer is yes. That's part of prayer. Part of prayer was God speaking to Matthew. Part of prayer was and this other concept that I'm just sort of thinking about is this man interceded to the Lord for someone else in his family and God answered the prayer and healed that girl and brought her back from the dead. The lady with the issue of blood, hers is a practical intercession. She just reached out to Jesus and I think that's part of what prayer is about. I say part. And the wild thing to me is in the crowd, Jesus sensed her presence. He sent her, her need. He saw that she was reaching out to him just like he knows when we reach out to him. Did the guys come and say, we must see Jesus. You know, who else can we turn to? So this other concept of prayer is, 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 is so far we've had Jesus appealing to the man. We've had the... Uh, ruler appealing to Jesus. We have this lady just not even saying anything, just reaching toward him to get, and all these prayerful things. You know, tonight if we pray, you know, it, it's, we're going to be praying for someone else, more than likely as we're going along. We'll be, we'll be reaching out to the Lord in prayer, but on the other time, he is going to be reaching down to us to work on our behalf. See, we're able to enter into this dialogue with the Father. We're able to, to trust in Him. And, 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 and at the same time that God is meeting our need, He says, I have some people. By the way, don't forget, there's a mission. 
the fields are white in the harvest. He says, I'm praying for you. And you need to pray to the Father, to the Lord of the harvest, that he'll send forth laborers. And really what he's saying is, I want you to be my laborers. He lays his hand on us. This prayer dialogue that's going back and forth in this chapter, sometimes it was initiated by God and sometimes it was initiated from the need of the people. And here it's initiated by people who don't even know a whole lot about God except saying, I've got a need. And you've heard this prayer. God, if you're really out there. And they ask him for help. And then he nudges your heart or mine and said, I want you to be my hand extended. I want you to be where I need you to be. I want you to go to help that person. I want you to go to share the gospel. Without, without a, a, a voice, they're not going to hear. And if you've ever watched 700 Club, you know that a lot of people in their testimony said, I got to wit's end. I said, God, if you're really out there, and God made a way, and he used people just like us. So in this idea of prayer, we had God working in our hearts, then people being obedient. We had people reaching from, from earth to heaven. We had people who just were reaching out to Jesus. And then we have the Father who is concerned for people who have yet to hear. And that's all the things we're going to pray about tonight, isn't it? People for healing. People for restored lives with the Lord a greater awareness of who he is and opening their heart to him. We're going to pray that way tonight. Matthew chapter 9 is just one day in the life and ministry of Jesus. And that's why he spent so much time in prayer alone. He withdrew to a solitary place. To have his heart and mind zeroed in on the things that are important. And that's really one reason we get together and pray tonight. We're praying about specific things, but we're praying for sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. That what he says, I need you, like Matthew, he says, follow me, that we would. Not just in, in around, but that we would let him order our steps. Some of the things we're, we're saying, Lord, I'm in way over my head and I need your wisdom and your direction. Uh, my dream is dead. He said, I can make it alive. I can't, I don't have, I'm making, I'm going spiritual on you. I don't, I can't see, I don't, uh, spiritually, I can't see what's coming down the line. And he says, do you trust me? Do you believe I can do all things? Yeah. And just like these blind men, he gave them sight. I believe he'll give us spiritual insight that we've never had before. So we're going to, I'm going to ask Sean if you'll put a CD on, on there. And we're going to pray. And these are the things that we're going to pray for. I just want you to know this dialogue never stops. And sometimes listening to God is just as important as doing his will. In Matthew, Jesus went about, I guess in Acts it says he went about doing good. And then there are some times when you just have to draw away and listen for his still small voice. I want to challenge us. We have to be people of faith. We have to be people of prayer. And in the beginning of this year, I believe that God has the best in store for us that's yet to come. Sean, if you'll start that, I'm going to ask you to find a place of prayer. When you are finished praying, you can consider yourselves dismissed. We're going to pray for the lost. We're going to pray for healing. Maybe you're going to say, I want to join someone else and pray regarding the healing of someone. Or some of you might want to pray for Teresa or, or Robin or whoever it is, or for Veda. Why don't you get together and say, let's just, a you know, couple, two or three of us, let's pray for Veda. Let's, let's get together and pray for, that, that would be perfectly in order. Let's pray for the Smith boys, that God would help them in this hurtful time and draw God's nudging us. To be an answer to prayer as well as dependent upon him in prayer. Sean, if you'll turn that up, let's find a place of prayer tonight.